uh, banana seed that I was wearing my Christmas. Uh, so that start us off. Wishing us all a Feliz Pesqua and a Happy New Year as that time comes up. Uh, Merry Christmas to all. The Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Haganya Revitalization, Self-Determination and Regional Affairs now convenes this public hearing. Public hearing notices were given to the media. The first notice was sent out on Monday, December 16th, 2019. And the second notice was sent out on Wednesday, December 18th, 2019. For the record, today is Monday, December 23rd, 2019, and the time is now 9.06. The committee will hear and accept testimonies, both oral and written, on the following. Bill 241-35-COR, authored by myself, Jose Pedro Terlahi, Speaker Tina Rose Munya Barnes, Senator and Vice Speaker Talina Cruz Nelson, and Clinton E. Rigel. It is an act to add a new Section 72110 to Chapter 72, Title 10, Guam Code Annotated, relative to creating and implementing a RIP Current and Hiking Safety Awareness Program and Outreach Plan. We will also be seeing the appointment of Audrea P. Scro to serve as a member of the Guam Educational Telecommunications Corporation, otherwise known as KGTF PBS Board of Trustees. However, the confirmation hearing for Audrea Scroll will be rescheduled to a later date. I want to uh, state my deep appreciation, especially this close to the holidays when I know we have so many things going on, to the senators who have taken the time and their busy schedules to be here. I have um, Senator Pito Chirlahi, who is the vice chair of uh, my self-determination uh, committee, and then I have Senator Will Castro here. So, Siduis Masi senators for being here. The conduct of this public hearing shall be as follows. Those testifying will be recognized in the order of the sign-up sheet. Written testimony may be read. Lengthy written testimony should be summarized to about five minutes. Now we have two people here, so I think we have a little bit of leeway in our time. Written testimony shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide our legislative staff with your written testimony for photocopying. Testimony shall be confined to the substance. Persons will be allowed to present oral testimony only once. Once you are done, you may be asked to remain in the room for questions or for additional testimony, as may be desired by the members of the panel. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is turned on and that you speak into the microphone. Please state your name clearly into the microphone from the record, excuse me, for the record, uh, before you begin. We will now begin hearing testimonies on bill number 241-35-COR. So uh, perhaps I will have the Director of Department of Parks and Recreation testify first, Mr. Abanis. Uh, Thank you, Senator Kelly Marsh Titano, my oversight. Uh, greeting Senator Jose Pito Terlahi and uh, greeting Senator William Castro. My name is Richard Ibanez. I am the Director of Parks and Recreation. And um, I'd like to be begin with my testimony regarding Bill 241-35. The Department of Parks and Recreation serves our island residents, visitors, and military through public parks and beaches and recreational activities. Safety is our top priority. We agree that Bill 241-35 will assist us with safety and awareness. Information for the general public is crucial for them to know about rip currents and hiking safety. Our island has seen one too many deaths and injuries, and it is clear that awareness and education about the potential dangers of our waters and hiking trails is key in preventing the loss of more lives. 
While the Department of Parks and Recreation has been diligent in working with partner agencies like the Guam Visitors Bureau, federal agencies, the National Weather Services, hotels, and others to keep the public informed, we agree with the intent and purpose of Bill 241-35 that posted signs and material with aid in further informing residents, visitors, military, and the public about potential hazards, especially in areas where agencies like ours are, are, are unable to reach. DPR would like to work with the author on minor adjustments before the measure progresses to the floor to ensure DPR can meet all the requirements of the bill. Although Bill 241-35 does not mention any funding sources, should it become law, DPR will work with its oversight chair within its budget or with federal partners for grant funding to maximize federal dollars so we can prepare for and implement an awareness program and prevent the loss of life. Best and keep our residents, visitors, military and everyone safe, no matter what part of the island they visit. We want to thank Senator Kelly Marsh Titano and the sponsors of this measure for having the foresight of the safety of our people. Sijuos Masi. Senator Maasi, for your testimony, uh, Director, uh, you hit a lot of important points and definitely we have seen too many losses. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and uh, open with the testimony of the National Weather Service uh, Guam and uh, the representative here. And actually, I think I, I threw myself off track with my Christmas bat. <laughs> And so after you're finished, I'll actually read uh, my opening statement to give people a little bit more information about the bill so they, they understand, have a clearer understanding of oh, the bill that we're <laughs> talking about. So I'll go ahead, uh, Mr. Landon, and let you go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to give my testimony in support of your bill, Senator Kelly Marsh, and also thank you, Senator Will Castro and Peter Chalahi for being here this morning. Um, the National Weather Service exists primarily to protect life and property. And so that is the sole purpose of our existence. So this bill alone helps support our existence here, not only on Guam, but across all of Western the Pacific. Our biggest natural killer in the region, many people think may be typhoons. That is not the case. We are one of the best prepared places in the United States when it comes to tropical cyclones. People know what to do, when to take action, and how to prepare and stay safe during a typhoon. It's the rip currents that is the number one natural killer in the region. How do we fix that problem? We have a number of problems here in the region uh, that we must ask first. How do people get weather information? Number two, how do people get their weather information? Number three, what do they do with that information? And number four, why do people still go out in hazardous conditions? I answered numbers one and two with a social science communications research project I did over 2017, 2018. I think you all were part of that. Uh, thank you for filling out the surveys. And that was based off of the motivation from January 18th, 2017, when a boat of paddlers flipped over in the Ganya boat basin. We had high surf advisories and a small craft advisory in effect for several days and yet this six-man paddling team went out in the water and they capsized. Fortunately for them, they all survived. Uh, rescue personnel were in the boat harbor at the time. Why do people go out in hazardous conditions? We can't answer that. That's a whole other social science. Um, as my colleague here just stated earlier, uh, there was a hiking incident August 2018 at Southern Colors Falls. There was a flash flood event. These things don't happen too often such that they get a lot of publicity, but this was a pretty significant event. A young teenager swept away in the floodwaters. We need to bring attention to these things because communication, education, outreach are key because if people don't know of these hazards, what these hazards mean, then we have a problem. It's a failure in the process. So this bill is very important to help us 
get that done because the weather service, this is all stuff that we do by our directives to protect life and property. Now that we have the collaboration from political elected leaders as well as other Guam agencies, we can better collaborate and get this mission accomplished to protect life and property. Um, in 2017, flash floods was the second leading cause of death weather-wise. That was 103 deaths nationwide in uh, 2017. And what is actually is a flash flood? Basically, it's a flash flood. It's a flood that occurs within minutes, sometimes without signs of rain. And that's what happens in central Guam on these hiking trails. People are hiking on a nice, sunny summer day. You might be going up the creek, but a mile away, you may have a heavy downpour sitting over that area of central Guam, and those floodwaters go through the creeks and the river valleys and can flow up 5, 10, 15 feet within 5 to 15 minutes. If people are not prepared for this, they can be swept away. So this is what we need to educate people on um, to prevent this from happening. And as well as the rip currents, that doesn't affect just local people, fishermen, paddlers, but also the tourism industry. How do we protect the lives of our tourists on Guam? Do we want people from Japan or Korea to come to Guam celebrating a, a wedding or a holiday only on day two of their vacation to Guam one of them perishes in a rip current. How do we prevent that from happening? Um, so this bill will be very beneficial to not only the Weather Service, but all of Guam and the tourism industry because we want people to come to this island and have a fantastic, memorable experience for the right reasons. So on behalf of the Weather Service, we are excited to work with you all on that. And as I mentioned, communication Education and outreach are key. We do have a number of brochures on various weather hazards, including rip currents. Uh, one of my proposals is that we, at the Weather Service, will make up a brochure specific to hiking and hiking safety. We could collaborate with uh, Parks and Recreation as well as other agencies on this island to complete that um, to protect life and property. Another outreach that we do is the Weather Ready Nation. All of you are part of the Weather Ready Nation. Thank you for your support and helping us get the word out. Uh, Casa Guam, when they were in publication uh, in 2018, they were giving us a full page just for weather information, free of charge. Uh, we were able to get a lot of weather information out on various hazards and safety issues related to weather. So thank you to Casa Guam and other partners for helping us get this word out because communication is key in that process. So definitely, uh, we talked on the phone before coming to this hearing this morning. Um, I do have a couple modifications that I do want to talk to you in further, uh, and then we're, we're good to go. So thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning, and thank you for uh, authoring this bill. Suzu uh, Mr. Adelet. It's very important for us to be hearing about the support from the uh, National Weather Station Guam, especially there's been quite a bit of experience that you have had in these sort of efforts. There's a lot of awareness on your, your part and you provided a lot of information for us to be thinking about as we're working to improve the bill and then deliberating on it. I do want to mention uh, that Senator Clint Rigel has joined us and I will explain to him uh, that I will now do my opening statement. I was wearing my Christmas hat earlier, I put myself on the screen, and it threw me off. <laughs> so I actually forgot to, uh, in my hastiness, I actually forgot to say my own opening statement. <laughs> so I will, I will go ahead and begin my opening statement. Bill 241, introduced by myself and co-sponsored by Senators Pito Trilahi, Speaker uh, Tina Rose Munya Barnes, Vice Speaker Talina Nelson, and Senator Clint Rigel. Bill 241 develops a, a rip current and hiking safety program and ensures that we are armed with information that can save our lives and the lives of those that we love. Guam is beautiful and special. With numerous na natural and cultural sites to love and experience firsthand. And uh, some has been mentioned already, but I'll go through it a little bit as well. That Guam has strong rip currents. Many in our community have 
stories about being pulled out to sea and just barely surviving uh, and being able to come back. And far too many families have stories of tragic losses of their loved ones due to such forces. And likewise, hiking, if anything, seems to be gaining popularity within our community, with visitors, with newcomers, with the military. They go out and set to explore the wonders of Guahan. However, we are also hearing heartbreaking stories of beloved family members being swept away, of the disease leptospirosis, which can be quite injurious, harming vital organs, and it can even be deadly, or getting lost in our jungles and savannas while everyone worries about their safety and whether they will make it out intact. Uh, there have been some days and nights where hikers have been lost and, and have not been able to be found for quite some time. Additionally, there are numerous other conditions. Fire ants, the banded hornet, bees nests, these are some major issues for those that are hikers. Not only issues as hikers, but we can actually be spreading some of the invasive species or some of these other elements um, when we're hiking. So I don't know that that's something in particular, the spreading of invasive species, that might be something that is talked about in this group as well. But we also have free ranging wildlife, such as babwi, the pig, which can be quite ferocious. I've heard of somebody being attacked and having to get 96 stitches being almost disemboweled. And carabao are out there as well. Now, I haven't specifically heard of a carabao attack, but it is something I'm conscientious of when I'm out there hiking, is that they are, what, a 2,000-pound animal, and they could come running at you if they chose to. So uh, we have several types of dangers out there in our rivers, our waterfalls, and along our hiking trails and our oceans. Um, with that, Bill 241 tasks the Department of Parks and Recreation to spearhead a public awareness program, along with specialists from other entities such as the Fire Department, Guam Homeland Security, the Department of Agricultural's uh, Forestry and Soil Division, and the Joint Region Marianas Safety Officer, uh, and the National Weather Station uh, Weather Service Guam, among others. And I'm pleased to be able to say that I've spoken to representatives from each of these entities, and they are very committed to being a part of a group like this. Um, I'm very excited to be part of this. We also have potential to be partnering with GBB, among others. In the bill, the Department of Parks and Recreation will create an outreach plan consisting of identifying hazardous beaches, rivers, and waterfalls, and hiking hazards, as well as dangerous conditions that each entails. Creating safety guidelines for signage at all major hiking trailheads and beaches with strip, uh, excuse me, strong rip currents. And then identifying programs that fund such safety initiatives. It seems at this time to be very fiscally prudent to scour all of our federal possibilities um, and see if we can get strong assistance there. For example, um, and we have Homeland Security here, so we'll be able to hear a little bit about uh, the tsunami initiative, but they were able to find strong funding sources, uh, is my understanding. But you can elaborate further uh, on, on the tsunami program. And then the group is also to recommend means to create awareness, avoidance, and mitigation of such conditions like we've seen for the tsunami preparedness program. Another example of this type of work has been done in Hawaii. So there are many ways that this can, these kind of issues can be addressed. In Hawaii, I've heard about programs where they actually bolster up, they strengthen their hiking trails by making sure that they're planting certain vegetation along the trails. We have some major erosion issues on Guam, and I've certainly heard stories about people getting injured as they fall along uh, parts of a trail and things like that. So we can look to examples like Hawaii. We have a lot of expertise on island about our vegetation and our soil conditions. And we can 
put that as part of the program, that forestry perhaps would head up that part of the, the approach and they would make sure that we are planting vegetation. I've gone hiking to Kanu'un, which is perhaps the older name for the area where Tarzan Falls is. And we have seen the difference over the years where the vegetation, the acacia trees have been planted there and you now have uh, control of the erosion. You now have almost like nature steps on your way down to the river. So there are certainly examples where we've seen positive outcomes here where some of that has already happened. So with that, uh, our community and visitors alike need and deserve to be better informed and protected so that we prevent as many incidents as possible and save as many lives as possible along the way. So now that I've finally done my opening <laughs> statement, um, I would also like to recognize that the um, Homeland Security Advisor, Mr. Tim Uggen, is here and call him to the table to provide testimony as well. Suzuis so Maasi for being able to attend. I know you had a fairly short notice, uh, so we, we appreciate your being able to come in and provide testimony. Oh, you want me to? Oh, my goodness. Has to be read. Oh, there you go. Half a day. There you go. Okay. Half a day. Merry Christmas. Uh, happy holidays, Senator Castro, uh, Senator Piru Terlahi, Senator Rigel, and Chairwoman uh, Kelly Mars Titano. Good morning. I am happy to be here to testify on uh, Bill 241-35 and here in support of my colleagues and of the bill. My name is P. Tim Muggan, and I will be providing written and oral testimony in support of Bill number 241-35, relative to creating and implement, implanting a rip current and hiking safety awareness program and outreach plan within the Department of Parks and Recs. Every year, first responders receive multiple calls of lost or missing hikers and distressed swimmers. A hiker's inability to return back to their anticipated start of endpoint can be attributed to a number of reasons to include inexperience, lack of proper navigation equipment, and the changing terrain from the weather. Likewise, swimmers often become distressed because of the lack of experience or a change in water conditions. As a coordinating agency in support of these types of uh, events, we have assisted first responders with their request for support. When local systems are overwhelmed or, with, or the responding agency lacks the capability, we often seek assistance from our military partners for aerial search and rescue support. Fortunately, response has been under the guise of immediate response authority, meaning the government of Guam is not billed for the use of these assets. However, the value of a single life outweighs the cost of any response or prevention measure. I will support any bill that works to increase public safety and decrease the number of deaths despite the cost. Last year, we grieved as a as an island for the loss of a 15-year-old boy, Xavier Akima. He was swept away by a flash flood after a period of heavy rainfall. We cannot change the past, but we can prevent similar losses from occurring. It is my humble opinion that an awareness and outreach campaign like the one listed here in Bill 241-35 can help limit the number of annual responses and prevent injuries and most importantly, death. By educating the public, it may make them think twice before taking unnecessary risks. Finally, as a partner in public safety, 
We can assist as always whenever needed. Thank you. Siduis Masi for your support, um, Mr. Egan. And you also brought to the forefront uh, that tragic loss last year, and, and really, I think, for the entire island. And, and over the years, we, our hearts have really gone out to those that have been lost, uh, injured, or have actually passed away because of situations like this. What I'd like to do is open this up uh, to the senators here to have them be able to ask some questions. I will go ahead and begin to my left with uh, Senator Pido Trilahi. Just a couple of uh, issues that I, not an issue, but just a couple of uh, reminders. And I, I just want to tell the uh, director of Parks and Rec that I am in support of this particular bill. As a former director for the uh, Civil Defense Guam Emergency Services Office, uh, Tim, thank you very much for uh, expressing those views regarding past incidents. And I also want to, uh, we cannot overemphasize uh, over the importance of the, uh, uh, the, na the nas uh, National Weather Service because the three of you um, that are here today deals with life and safety civil defense and uh, parks and rec and and uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, parks and rec do need additional um, uh, uh, officers um, and I think you mentioned like two officers and though this bill doesn't address the uh, the budget the money for for the two officers uh, rest be assured that I will be working on the bill to make sure that we have that in place uh, I don't know, uh, we need to really uh, research further. If or not, we're gonna get those people in as, as, uh, as permanent, classified, unclassified, or just uh, uh, part-time uh, you know, uh, officers for uh, Parks and Rec. But rest be assured that I will work on that. And uh, Tim, also, uh, there are several things, because we had this meeting up at Civil Defense at one time, regarding emergency responses, uh, re uh, recoveries, and, and all these things. And uh, uh, we didn't really acknowledge the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the director of the Red Cross. And, you know, civil defense have to work hand in hand with the, uh, with the Red Cross. So with that, I, I just want to thank you all. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for allowing us to, to hear your, your testimony this morning. Sister Masi. Thank you, Senator. Sutus Masi, uh, Senator Trilahi. I will now go ahead and open it up to Senator Rajal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a question for um, the DPR Director, uh, Mr. Ibanez. Um, forgive me if I'm unaware of whether or not uh, you do have a page or a Facebook page. Do you have any sort of a social media page? No, we don't, Senator. That's, I know it might be a little extra work, of course, to run a page, but that could be an easy way also to help uh, educate the public, disseminate information. Um, the National Weather Service only recently began its Facebook page. Um, I remember in the past it was just a website, and then now, and now I know through the National Weather Service's uh, Guam Facebook page, they're able to put a lot of information out and get a lot of um, uh, warning out and and just educational stuff out about weather events and perhaps that's something uh, Parks and Recreation could look into doing and that could be another avenue for educating the public about safety and uh, warning the public about um, flash flood risks, uh, especially when National Weather Service puts out an advisory saying uh, stay away from hiking around rivers because of the flash, uh, risk for flash flooding. That's, that's a potential avenue for you guys to put out those warnings that the National Weather Service creates. So that's all I wanted to add. And other than that, of course, I'm a co-sponsor of the measure, so I fully support it. I think it's a great idea to um, focus on educating the public and awareness and prevention rather than responding to tragic events um, so we can prevent it from happening. I think actually we save money in the long run uh, instead of having to tap into all the resources to go out and search for hikers or search for someone who's been swept out to sea. Uh, we can save money just by getting the word out and educating people 
so that we avoid those unfortunate situations. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. If I may, uh, Senator Rajo. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're tracking, but uh, Guam Homeland Security Office of Civil Defense does put out those notices once we receive it from National Weather Service, and we also provide these safety tips and warnings to the public. But more importantly, I feel uh, in my mind that uh, GVB has a critical part in this also because uh, more often than not, it's not a local resident. It's a, either a tourist or military member that gets lost or swept out to sea. Uh, with that in mind, I believe also that PBS, our uh, local network run by the government, should also be uh, a partner in this so that we can reduce the amount of cost and work together as far as the tourist messaging as we invite our guests here and we welcome our military members to Guam that we also put out these warnings and I think collectively that we'll be able to send that message out successfully. Thank you. I think those are great ideas. <laughs> So yeah, that's absolutely the right way to go. Yes, we need to include everyone. I, I didn't mean to pick on Parks and Rec. I was just asking if you had one. So that's another layer uh, that we can add. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Uggen has added more layers that we can add. Um. Yeah, let me just piggyback on that. Um, social media is where information is communicated. Uh, I've been running following our f numbers on our Facebook page as well as our web page. And when it comes to storm events over the last three years, our Facebook numbers can be upwards of tenfold what our web page gets. Social media is key. And so if you have any questions about social media, I know Homeland Security, Jenna, uh, she runs a great uh, social media campaign as well as the Weather Service. Uh, that's where the information goes quickly. And so we do want to collaborate on that as well. But thanks to Homeland Security for taking a lot of our weather posts because when media partners, PNC, KUAM, other radio stations, newspapers, and Homeland Security, when they share our posts, our audience expands rapidly. And so that is key to getting information out quickly. And so, yes. So that's really improved how we communicate weather threats in the region. Um, I'd like to add on to that also, um, to my two colleagues, now that I'm gonna start a Facebook page, I hope I get all those posts so that I can repost. That way the message goes, you know. Right, Tim? Yes, Director, we will fully support you. Thank you, Advisor. <laughs> You know, I'm a firm believer in teamwork, and that's part of why I felt it was so important to have this approach. We have so much expertise on island. We have so many good programs, agencies, uh, national partners on island that we're leveraging all of them. We're putting our heads together, and we're coming up with really good approaches, really thoughtful approaches, and we're putting that expertise to work. And we're, we're already hearing some of what is going to be shared and the direction and the expertise that can be benefiting all of us. So I appreciate this continued um, sharing of information and these thoughts. Uh, we'll see if any need to go into the bill, but if not, at least they help us as senators and the community itself understand the potential that you all bring and the benefits of a group like this to have six, seven, eight or more uh, different types of experts tackling this. Um, so I'll, I'll save the rest of my comments, though. Um, I'm just such a big teamwork supporter, so, um, and that's partly why I really thank my colleagues up here as well, is uh, I think us senators also balance each other out, and, and we each have different fields of experience and expertise that we bring to questioning and thinking these things through. I will now turn this over to Senator Castro. Thank you, uh, Dr. Marsh. You know, there are probably 40, no, not probably, I, I'm pretty sure that there are over 35 master plans in the books. Uh, I'm, I'm not even aware of how many uh, regional, municipal, agency master plans they may be at your level. Uh, so I'm always discouraged when we're attempting to put onto the books uh, not just a state plan or a municipal plan or an agency plan, 
but now we're looking at a, an outreach plan. And I'm not disagreeing with the intent uh, of the plan or the desire to save lives, um, but I just, not for the purposes of public debate, because I'm not debating my colleague, I'm sharing my thoughts in hopes that we can amend the bill to be stronger, or perhaps uh, before I'm, I um, end my discussion here, I can offer some solutions in terms of getting around this additional legislative piece that requires the government of Guam, um, yet again, to do something else beyond over and above the pressing issues facing the economy and education and public safety, uh, over and above rip currents or other maritime hazards. I, I think those are important, by the way. That's a very soft spot for the record, uh, having been the former bureau director. As a matter of fact, Dr. Marsh would be wonderful if I can have uh, our colleagues from the Bureau of Statistics and Plans, which is by statute the central planning authority for the government of Guam, be great if they're here. I'm really happy that the Homeland Security Advisor is here because it's in his shop uh, that emergency response and preparedness uh, should be addressed and coordinated at the highest level, uh, both in times of distress but also in times uh, where there's not a lot to worry about in terms of natural or man-made disasters. And so it's good, uh, Madam Chair, that we have the DPR director here. I think his expertise in a lot of areas could contribute. I'm also elated that our federal counterpart is here. There are so many more federal co uh, members of the community that should be at the table, but this is a great start, and I'll commit to being a part of this discussion going forward. Uh, but again, I think uh, even these hazards need to be linked to a, a larger strategic plan. When you have storm water runoff, when you have flash floods as a result of distress or um, troubled, troubled climate conditions in the area, you know, that's way beyond just near shore or uh, threats from the ocean, right? That probably emanates from, from valleys and other areas, and so we want to include those people. I'm not sure what's going to make up this master plan, and I actually would want to revisit the provision in the bill that requires you, Director, to produce such a master plan in 90 days. Um, my hat will be off. I don't know if it will be completed in 90 days if you pull that off in three months. Uh, assuming you're going to have to coordinate with 20 plus agencies, I mean, that would be probably the most uh, stable way to approach this from a community standpoint is to get as many stakeholders and as much stakeholder input uh, as you could. I'm happy to hear that there isn't an, an appropriated amount uh, because the debate rages on in terms of how much is out there and what the priorities are. I do want to encourage again, Madam Chair, as we look at this, I appreciate the in-kind contributions, assuming no overtime from your line staff, uh, that you're going to put on the table to coming up with a comprehensive plan to address hazardous conditions such as riptides and other type of maritime hazards. Of course, Madam Chair, you probably already know this, and our friends at the Bureau of Statistics and Plans uh, can relate that there are federally funded programs that do exactly this. They may not touch necessarily on this specific one uh, to our representative from National Weather Service. We understand that the Coastal Management Program uh, under the leadership of Edwin Regis, they're very capable. Now, it, it falls within their mandate, that much I, I, I think I'm right on, so you may want to consult with them, Director, to see what they can do to tweak that. And I'll tell you where uh, the silver lining could also be. It could also be in building upon their very progressive approach uh, in the use of technology. And my colleague over here, Senator uh, Clint Rigel, uh, hit it on the head. I think social media is good, uh, but you might want to look at push technology as well, and not, not just when people go to Facebook, but things like WhatsApp. But I would also encourage you, both of you, since you'll be leading, well, actually, you, Director, uh, you'll be leading this planning effort if this bill was to come into law to confer with the Homeland Security Advisor uh, because he's attempting to pull off a major task that had started in the previous administration and I, I really hope the governor and her senior team are able to execute this in a way that none of us had ever imagined in the prior administration and I think Mr. Uggins already on that path. It's push technology that's managed out of the Fusion Center which will include all hazards. And this is a conversation I raise even with our partners at Joint Region Marianas. You see, I take exception to the closure of those fishing grounds, but I pleaded with them. I asked for some compromise to meet us, uh, not halfway because we're going way beyond the halfway mark as far as the local community is concerned, but couldn't they invest a little bit of money in that platform that Homeland is attempting to put together and launch and fund that gives these maritime alerts that we're gonna close off these fishing areas? 
you know, because I've been out there and I'm pretty sure that we still get cell coverage. And if not, then I think our military partners can find a way to make sure that there's, self, there's cell coverage. Mr. Uggen, in these dark spots, these so-called dark spots, as a matter of fact, uh, gentlemen, especially from the administration, there are dark spots on the island. I know because we were looking at the marble area at one time. It was a $12 million endeavor to, to upgrade the infrastructure, which would include the uh, two-way handheld radios. And Madam Chair, I bring this all up now because I'm hoping on the day of show, when we go on to the session floor, it's not, it's not customary for me to get up there and be caustic and debate the finer points that I think are really, really at the minutia level. So I want to kind of tease this out here. So when we go on the floor, the committee would have done its work and addressed a lot of the concerns of not only myself, but our colleagues. And so that would be one of them. Tie in the federal government in terms of our Department of Defense partners and find out what they can put on the table, what they can ante up to help us uh, dissuade people from putting other lives at risk. And you know what, Madam Chair? You know, I always try to take a deep breath before I speak from an emotional standpoint, but it just really uh, gets my feelings all bubbled up when I, when I think about how we are going out of our way um, to do certain things to catch it on the reactive end. But I don't know how to plan for this. Um, I certainly don't know how to speak to this in public because there are things that are probably not socially acceptable. But let me try my best. I think we need to start planning to hold people accountable when they put other lives at stake. You see? And I think that you've got to start holding people accountable when they start utilizing government resources to save other people's lives because you decided to go out there when it was stormy weather, 12 foot, 12 feet waves. I mean, I know what my father would have done to me if I attempted to do that, and I'm not going to go on the record to say what exactly I did, as these FD brothers of mine are smiling because they probably would have done the same thing. But my point would be, there should be some provisions in this plan that account for that. When you decide to use very limited government resources, worse, when you put these hardworking men and women of Guam Fire and Rescue, of which they get not enough credit, when you start attaching a dollar amount, it goes into the tens of thousands and the hundreds of thousands, and God forbid, lives, right, which is unquantifiable. So can we please put a, a piece of that in that plan that looks at it from a more conservative perspective in terms of holding people accountable to be responsible, teaching them to be responsible for those under their care. I don't want to go too much further into that. I do want to contribute some other finer points. I agree with you, Madam Chair. We had a sidebar here. Uh, I think signage, signage is a, a tremendous tool. My gosh, nothing uh, more informative than a four-foot reflective sign that says rip currents, lives may be lost. I think one of those beaches has that. I mean, when you see a sign that says you could die, I, I think twice about going in if it's rough water. So signage matters. But again, before you put up too many signs on the beaches about people getting in the water when it's rough, I would encourage, I would encourage the administration uh, to put up some reflective signs and some road markers so that we don't hit these things on a regular day when it's, when it's not stormy. And I'll I'll end with this. Madam Chair, I want to encourage, uh, I want to close on a high note. First of all, I want, to, I want to reassure you that you have my commitment, Dr. Marsh. I've always committed to working with people who are able to uh, be workable, who are wanting to find a workable solution, and you've never demonstrated otherwise. And so I commit to su supporting you to find some um, provisions within this plan that makes sense for us as a people. Uh, please utilize technology. Uh, please uh, make an attempt in your plan to address other maritime safety alerts. I, I made some notes as you were talking. Please utilize push technology. I know Facebook's a, a great tool, but, but don't take it from me because I'm one of those guys on Facebook, but I understand that the younger demographic, that there's a mass exodus from things like that platform because so many old people like me are on it. So you might want to look at other creative ways for push technology. I think, again, Homeland Security uh, is looking at that. And I want to thank you. Uh, this is great to see collaboration between our NWS folks, our DPR folks, our Homeland Security uh, professionals. Uh, but I'd like to see more. And I'm, again, I'm willing to host it. I'm willing to sit with you, Dr. Marsh, tight to know. Uh, I'd like to see the Bureau of Statistics and Plans, which has a, a wealth of knowledge and experience in central planning. Uh, also, would like to see uh, folks from uh, NOAA 
uh, the University of Guam and some other agencies. And so thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chair. I do appreciate the opportunity to offer my thoughts on an outreach plan that may not necessarily require legislation, uh, may require another roundtable with the senior staff of the administration. And, and I bet with the stroke of a pen, this can happen and be funded with federal funds if that is the state's priority. In this case, uh, the unincorporated territory, which I think is one of the most obscene terms I've ever heard. Thank you. Unincorporated, it's not even in a lexicon. Seduce Masi to all of my colleagues for uh, providing some input. And um, with this, I'll, I'll go ahead and go into some of my questions and comments as well. Uh, certainly, it's really important to be proactive. Part of the reason for this legislation is that it just, you know, there have been small efforts here and there, but setting it up as a program where it's permanently established and it will be permanently looked after uh, so that it can be updated and reinvigorated and kept on task, I think is really important. Um, when we talk about some of the different factors about time, about cost, we're talking about saving lives. And so definitely that has to be into the mix that we have to look at the, the lives and the value of those for our community. And that has to be given a high level of priority. I've definitely heard some thoughts about holding those accountable that are out there endangering lives. I live in an area where uh, fires sweep through nearly every year and usually several times in a year. And we evacuate, we worry about our house, we worry about our material belongings, our family photos, and all of those things that you collect along the way. And, uh, and, and think about those that are creating the fires, because we're told by forestry and soil and other divisions that these are all human created, and yet they're putting all of our lives at risk and, and so forth, um, and, and how to address that. So this falls along some of those same lines. Uh, one of the questions I'm gonna be having for Homeland Security and Civil Defense in a minute is about the cost of those because sometimes we have to have those helicopters that drop whatever it is that they are dropping onto the fire. Um, we've heard just really outrageous costs for each of those drops in the tens of thousands of dollars, I think, per drop. And so cost is definitely a factor and I really appreciate um, Senator Clint for mentioning that these kind of proactive measures may also have cost savings to them. That if we can save those lives, if we can figure out a way to discourage those from going out there in hazardous conditions, whether they're aware or unaware, if we can figure out ways to tackle that, that we're going to be saving tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars every year, as well as the lives which are just invaluable. Um, and to the, our tourism industry, I mean, um, if we're helping rein in that part of our reputation, that we're a safer destination that takes this seriously, that's going to help our tourism industry. With, um, with mention of some of our federal partners. So I, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, if I accidentally slipped over it or if I mentioned it too quickly, but I have had some discussion with Rear Admiral Minoni, and he had talked about the fact that this has also been a concern of their safety officer, and he has committed his safety officer to working with this group. That, that safety officer has a lot of experience already. They've developed a military program that, um, that addresses much of this, and they've created a, a video. And so Rear Admiral Minoni and I talked about that perhaps while we're developing um, a wider audience sort of video for our community and for our tourists, that we could work with the hotels to use that hiking video that they've developed to start getting that awareness out there and not having to wait the 90 days or the couple of months that it's gonna to take to get this bill forward 
time really is of the essence. And the longer that we wait to, you know, it's again, it's that balance. The longer that we wait to develop this, the longer that we wait uh, to weigh out the, mer the merits of a plan, the potential of lives being lost is, is there. So um, we have Joint Region Marianas, we have the National Weather Service Station, and some of the other par possible partners. Um, I, I think they will be very interested in being part of this, such as NOAA, um, and um, that we're going to be able to get a lot of support from them. So. With that, uh, I'll start off with a question for a question or two for DPR, the Department of Parks and Recreation. I really appreciate that Mr. Adelet mentioned that there should be a social science approach to much of what's going to be done by this program, because we do have people that they know the warning signs. Um, Ahead of time, they may even read signage, but they still go out there. The high surf advisories are, are out there, and yet people might go out anyway. And so to address this, I was thinking there are different parts of the program where the social science understanding could really come in. Uh, because part of this program is to understand the best way to inform people through signage. Different types of signage work for different people and we have multiple languages going on here. I've been part of a group like that and um, you know, having uh, very instructive illustrations has been an important part of the approach. People understanding the illustrations when they might not understand the, the language. But then also psychologically, how are we gonna respond to it? Um, how to best help them understand how to read the signage and how to call in for help. These are things that are addressed in the bill that need to be tackled by the group. And how to address the issues, like I said, of going out despite the warnings. So for the Department of Parks and Recreation, are you open to having perhaps social scientists uh, from the University of Guam where uh, people from Department of Youth Affairs and people from Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center be part of this working group? Um, thank you, Senator. That could be an option. Currently, um, we do have three beaches under our inventory, which, is, which are Inarahan Pool, Ipau, and Matapang. Ipau Beach does have a multi-language sign and all our lifeguards are trained to spot any um, rip currents or a distressed swimmer and um, constantly being watched. Of course, I was there yesterday. Uh, some visitors were too close to an area that's about 14 feet. It's to the right of the beach and they blow their whistle. So um, with those other agencies, I'm, I mean, the more help I can get, the better because obviously, you know, safety is a concern, but uh, for Inarahan and um, Matapeng, I was thinking of looking uh, to seek out assistance from DPW to create the signs. And uh, I, I will be reaching out to them soon, uh, even if the, you know, the bill um, is still in, on the floor, but I am gonna w want to speak with DPW to see if we can get more signage up there. Malik, and the other question that I have is, I know you do have some patrol officers, so um, I'm glad you addressed the, the type of level of lifeguard training and their abilities while they're out there watching over our beaches. With patrol officers, uh, do you know, do they have some of the same sort of training that they know how to identify um, some warning signs yes. uh, being exhibited? Yes, Senator. Um, our, our territorial patrol park officers are also trained to watch out for distressed swimmers. As you know, we only have two at the moment. And today, we um, unfortunately, one is on sick leave and one is off. So what I do is I collaborate with GVB's VSOs. I call um, uh, Mr. Paul Suba and inform him that 
we don't have any patrol officers today. And what he does is he shifts his manpower to assist us at the beaches. So we do have VSOs in Agatnya, Paseo, and Matapang and Ipau. So to answer your question, yes, our park patrol rangers are trained. That's very good to hear. Um, that our patrol officers are trained to watch out for these sort of things, and then also that you are collaborating with GBB so that we can rest assured that there is some proactivity out there and there is some of this monitoring available. Uh, for uh, Mr. Adelit, I'm glad that you brought up many the many points that you did, um, and. It's good hearing from several of the people here about uh, the effectiveness of social media and how it gets out there. And this is some of the discussion that I've had with yourself and Mr. Uggen, is how to get these messages out there. And so we've had some discussion. We already do have some digital signage. There may be more in our future. Uh, we almost all, if not all, have a cell phone. And so you've had some very uh, productive conversations about how we can get that messaging to our visitors and others through the digital signage, through our phones, so that people can get real-time messaging. And whether they're walking on the streets of Tumon because they're a tourist and shopping, or they're a local resident that's uh, maybe even in the middle of hiking, and they're still within cell phone reception that they can be getting some of these um, these kinds of messages. I, I don't think we have all the answers yet, but I think a program like this where you can sit down and collaborate and, and work on this um, and have it as a current goal or a future goal, we can get some of those things put into place. So it's not sounding a whole lot like a question at this point. I, I, I started talking about it quite a bit, but. Um, are there other thoughts in that uh, in that line of thinking that you'd like to share, <laughs> Mr. Adelaide? <laughs> yeah, the, the uh, push notifications, I really, really, really like those, but we don't have that capability across the mass majority. Um, maybe Tim would have more information on what we call wireless emergency alerts or WIAs. That's more commonplace in the continental United States. We do not have that capability here at this time, and maybe you have more information on that, Tim, as far as how that's coming along, but um, social media is what's carrying us so far. Uh, prior to us having the Facebook page at the Weather Service, it was all by our web page, whether people knew about our web page or not, whether they knew where to find that information on our web page or not. Social media is a much easier way to get life-saving information to people in a plain language format. Uh, the digital signs, you and I, we've talked about that in the past. We cannot mandate private companies to put out information, whether they get paid for it or free of charge, but th the framework that I would like to follow comes out of the Springfield, Missouri Weather Forecast Office, where they have a partnership with the uh, Lamar Outdoor Advertising, and they have direct access on 55, I believe, electronic billboards across the WFO warning area. And so what happens if there's a critical weather emergency or threat coming through their weather forecast office jurisdiction, they can put out that information, whether it's a tornado warning, a flash flood warning, winter weather warning, or something of that sort, and they can put a pre-planned template and flash it up on the screens. It'll be in that rotation on the signage. I would love to see something like that out here, and I believe there's two different companies that run the electronic billboards out here on the island. Again, we cannot mandate them to do this. We can't force them to do that, but if we could get a, a working agreement, a partnership with them, especially in Tumon, um, that would be another way to get information out to the people. Sidhu's Masi, and uh, yeah, I, I think this is the importance of these conversations that we've been having, we're having now, and that will potentially be happening in the future. I mean, we definitely need to be having these conversations. I, got, I was thinking about signage. Um, maybe you can talk to your counterpart in Saipan. I don't, you're probably familiar with the Grotto in Saipan. They used to not have signage up there about the hazards of the currents and the waves down in the hole. Over the last several years, they erected a beautifully vivid, bright sign of the water dangers. And it's a lot of red, a lot of reflection. 
so you cannot miss it before you go down the steps. I don't know if you could contact them and find out the, the, the variety of numbers of rescues and problems before the sign and then after the sign because that would be great for places such as um, Pocket Cave. We've had a lot of people have problems there when they jump off the cliff. A lot of military service members, um, they've had problems over the years. A lot of them were rescued, but there's been a lot of casualties over there as well. So signage would be great. And there are signs at the Pocket Trailhead, but it's all about do not set fires, do not litter, do not do this, but it avoids the topics of rip currents and water dangers. So that's one thing I like to see added at places like that. If I may, uh, Chair Ms. Chairman. Uh, okay, so uh, there's a couple things I wanted to add. Uh, one of them, uh, when uh, the good Senator uh, Castro mentioned about communications, uh, there's a couple of things that we are actually uh, in motion right now that we are going to roll out in 2020. Uh, one of them would be FirstNet. It's the emergency communications. Uh, although it's not um, radio generated, but uh, it's in partnership with Docomo and AT&T where uh, our first responders have a super highway during a catastrophic event. Uh, and hopefully these dark spots or the areas that have drop calls will be able to, uh, they will be able to invest the infrastructure to get these antennas up so we do have reception for our first responders. That's one. Uh, we're also working with a third party private entity, myself, uh, uh, Homeland Security and uh, the Office of Technology. Uh, we're working with a third party for another platform uh, application that is uh, for the public to use for live feed during uh, any type of emergency, which is also something that we plan to roll out in 2020. Uh, the third thing that we're also working in on is alert us. Uh, similar to all the sirens throughout the island, uh, we just received approval from FEMA uh, for us to install these monitors that have digital and voice messaging to the areas where you cannot hear the sirens uh, or the loud voice uh, inside your building, uh, which will also be controlled at simultaneously when the sirens go off, this messaging will be sent out to the schools. And in fact, we met with uh, GDOE and the Mayor's Council of Guam to figure out how we're going to allot these types of devices throughout the island. So in regards to communication, we have been proactive, ma'am. Uh, and we are working in conjunction with our partners throughout the government. Uh, another point I wanted to bring up when you mentioned wildfires and forestry. Uh, previously, uh, a couple weeks ago, the region, FEMA Region 9 Administrator, Mr. Bob Fenton, was here. I had a chance to sit down with him. Uh, one of the things that I've, uh, through my tenure here, short tenure this year, uh, I've noticed that the Forestry Division of the Department of Agriculture desperately needs some support. Uh, so in that way, I uh, seeked out uh, support from FEMA, Region 9. Uh, they recommended, and I soon will be having meetings with the California uh, State Emergency Management, uh, California Forestry, California Fire, to uh, see and uh, receive best practices uh, and kind of find out well, what their framework is, uh, how they uh, support uh, their forestry division and their firefighters, uh, something that we can mirror for our, our own island and help uh, the forestry uh, division in Department of Agriculture. And thirdly, uh, the Guam Army National Guard, uh, they have a helicopter division. Uh, it's something that, uh, thinking out of the box, their capabilities right now, uh, I'm thinking that, you know, the Navy HC-5 sometimes has their own primary mission, and at times it's during wildfires. Uh, so if, in a way, uh, Major General Aggie can um, take a look at the resources, build the capabilities of the helicopter division out there, and see if they can assist by authority of the governor uh, to activate them during these wildfires and protect our people and our infrastructure and our assets and save lives. Uh, that's it. Thank you. 
that was uh, a lot of very useful information and um, we definitely, myself included, appreciate the proactivity that we do have out there in the agencies. And, and I think a, a lot of times it's not given its due recognition. And so we do really appreciate all the hard work that everyone is doing to be proactive and, and thinking of solutions ahead of time. Uh, so in continuing this with uh, the National Weather Service, I really appreciated your comments about comparing some of the potential of a program like this to how well prepared we are right now for typhoons. I think that really resonates with people that they would really understand to be able to have that comparison, that we are very ready when it comes to, and we have heightened sense of awareness of what to do and how to get ready for typhoons. And if we can develop that same level or a, as close to it as possible, a level of understanding amongst our community about these dangers that are around us, um, I, you know, I, I see great potential in a program like this. And quite frankly, it's been in the last several years that I've learned a lot of things. I mean, I've grown up doing a certain amount of hiking and certainly swimming out there. And um, for some of the hiking, some of those things like the, uh, I have to go back to it, the leptospiral, leptospirosis. Uh, I'm still obviously learning how to, to say that. But, you know, I, I hadn't heard of it until the last few years. But with all of our free ranging uh, deer, carabao, and other animals that are out there, the bacteria from them gets into the rivers. And I've now met several people that have contracted it at least once or several times, and it's damaged their liver. Um, it's, it's a really devastating thing. So with all of these things that we may not be aware of, even though we think we're a pretty astute person, um, we, we definitely need to get out there and make sure that we're, we're saving them uh, as much as possible from contracting this bacteria or uh, getting injured or saving lives. Definitely. So with that, um, we already addressed uh, the potential of digital signage, phones, and uh, the pushing out in social media awareness uh, in one way or the other. And I think that's been very fruitful discussion. And I think, or not I think, but I know we've had some conversation as well as to how perhaps some of this sort of information can go along with your developing your ambassador uh, program, and I think you're also working on a school awareness program about being weather ready. Uh, so is there potential in those two programs to bring forth some of this information? Most certainly. Um, the Weather Ready Nation, that is one of our key outreach initiatives, and one of my personal goals is to get every public school and private school signed up with this initiative. Um, if somebody has a good means of way of doing that, I would appreciate the uh, insider information because reaching out to the youth on the island is key because the teachers share that information to the students, the students share with each other, and as well as the family members and friends across the island. The more people that know about these hazards, the better. Uh, when it comes to these multiple hazards on hiking trails, that's going to be a multifaceted approach. Uh, different agencies and people are going to have to work together to build a brochure, for example, where part of it would cover weather hazards, but others would con consider the health problems, whether it's an infection or cuts and scrapes and first aid. So that would be a multi-agency collaboration to get these brochures, or each entity can make their own brochure. But again, it goes back to outreach and education, because when these threats occur, you either know about it or you don't. And so that's all the goes back to being proactive versus reactive. The Weather Service, we prefer to be proactive. Um, we don't like to have surprises on us. We don't want to have a, what we call an island convection event, which is what generates these flash flood events over the southern mountains. We see the signature in some of our models or some of the weather conditions, and we might start talking about island convection. 
And what that is, is a thunderstorm that builds up in place. It may move very little or may not move at all. You may remember Micronesia Cultural Fair got flooded out of Ipau Beach a number of years ago, then GVB moved it to May. That was the Island Thunder event. It sat right over Ipau Beach, flooded them. Uh, two people were struck by lightning that very day, one in the Ganya Boat Basin, one in off of Agate. When we see that signature, people should think, okay, island convection, we might have three to six inches of rain in a couple hours in one location, and then two miles down the street, it's bone dry and sunny. And that's the, the nature of how specific these weather phenomena are. So you could have a significant flash flood event at San Carlos Falls, but at Segua Falls, no problem. It's that isolated. So getting the information about those specific hazards and how to look out for the signs of those threats, that's going to be uh, the tricky part. And it's all about education, communication. Uh, before I leave, I just want to ask the uh, director of uh, Parks and Recreation to, uh, if you can, give me an outline. Are you planning on having a uh, uh, parks and recreation officers reserves. That's that's correct. Because Senator. I think you know we were talking about two individuals on the classified, maybe a classified employment or unclassified. But I would think that you can you can get more uh, police reserves, and we'll tailor that down with what we have with the Department of Correction officers. Uh, you know, uh, with the one police department, and maybe we can go with the 42 hours at $500 a week. Because I think you can, you can uh, get more people to be involved, and I'll tailor that down. Uh, I need your outline on just how many uh, officers that you need, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, probably find uh, uh, the budget for it later on. But I'm gonna tailor that down with the, like the one police department and the Department of Correction program. Thank you, Senator. Absolutely. Okay. I'll get All that right. information to you as soon All as possible. Right. Thank you. And um, I'd also like to give uh, Senator Castro the opportunity to make another statement or question, and then I'll, I'll finish my last few questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, um, listening to one of the panelists, it um, reminded me of a couple things. So I just want to put this on the table for inclusion in your committee report. I would encourage us to look at uh, any type of marine spatial master plan. And then the, the other issue would be the use of GIS layers. I know that, uh, again, BSP has been a champion in this area, has developed, uh, had the capacity to bring in these different uh, land layers and overlay them on a single Guam land mobile app. I know, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've had this discussion again with the administration to bring the Guam land mobile app back. And I think uh, Landon and your folks when you eventually uh, attain this data, you can migrate that to this uh, platform that they're attempting to develop out of Homeland Security. And so why do I bring that up? Because if you have recreational boaters or swimmers or hikers or anybody who, who might be affected by extreme weather conditions, they can pull up this mobile app uh, that also protects their identity, as I've been made to understand. And then they can look at the trails, they can look at the storm water runoff areas. So if you were to invest good money uh, with our federal partners out of the Coastal Zone Management Program or Coral Reef Initiative, whichever one of those, that might be a really good investment. But before we spend any money, I would, I would probably reach deep into NWS and or NOAA because I, I wouldn't doubt that they have those modeling uh, type data already available that can be migrated to this platform. So again, Madam Chair, the two key points there would be uh, marine spatial planning considerations uh, because there could be recreational uh, craft, watercraft that's in the water. We might know where these traditional fishing areas are from Anyahak, et cetera, and that might be the first place if you had very limited resources to reach out. Never mind the pamphlets on day of show when there was extreme weather condition warning, that might be the place to go. Just publicly notify them with our friends at agriculture as an idea. And then the GIS layers that already exist uh, that can help us make use of this information. Thank you. By the way, thank you. I didn't get an opportunity to thank you, Director. Uh, and Mr. Homeland Security Advisor and Mr. Landon from NWS for participating. I do appreciate your time uh, on this Christmas season. Happy holidays uh, to you and your, your respective agency employees. Thank you, Senator. 
Yes, I think that helps um, highlight some of the ways that NOAA um, and others could be really good partners. Um, there's all kinds of safety issues um, and situations that are involved in, in uh, rip currents and, and high key safety. Um, I really appreciated the point that you made that we cannot change the past. And so to paraphrase it, I, I wrote it down a little differently, but we absolutely can change the future and we have a responsibility to. And so um, to nest this somewhere, to get it situated somewhere so that it's a constant, it's something that will be constantly addressed, constantly updated, constantly uh, improved so that and again, I know I've mentioned it a couple times, but um, the tsunami awareness program, that preparedness program has been really important. We've seen it in the theaters, we've seen it on TV um, and elsewhere. And for most of us growing up here, we hadn't seen something like that before. So we see how a program can be developed and make a real difference so that we can now all quote and cite certain things that we might not have been able to before about safety uh, and, and about how to respond to situations. Um, like with the, uh, the rip current, um, maybe our first reaction is to panic, but it, this is the opportunity that when you hear a message enough that you can have a different reaction to it. So, you know, I don't know what all the answers are, but swimming diagonally or not panicking and letting your body relax, those are some of the things that I heard that might be uh, ways to help start mitigating the situation. But our natural reaction is gonna be panic. So that message needs to be, I think, said over and over in multiple ways so that it will become a natural reaction and we'll remember that message. So that's part of the potential there. Um, the one question that I had here was uh, whether you know any of those costs of rescue units when they go out, um, when the helicopters go out to look for missing hikers um, or something like that. Are you, do you have any familiarity with some of those costs, even at ballpark figures? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, no, actually, I just had conversations with uh, a couple of the National Guard members. I actually have not sat down with uh, Major General Aggie to discuss this, but uh, it's just my out-of-the-box thinking. Um, I'm sure because it's the National Guard um, that, you know, they have the capabilities uh, at the lowest cost possible. Um, and response and other emergency management or response uh, equipment. I, I'm, I don't have that number right at the top of my head, but that's something that we can uh, actually uh, try and get that information. Um. Yeah, when the, when the group is uh, working together, uh, potentially uh, this group will be getting together and, and working together, um, I think those, that builds on very good points that Mr. Adelet was mentioning. Um, and I'm very interested, you know, I just was in Saipan and I would have liked to have taken a, a photo of that signage, but maybe I can find it online uh, or, or get it through a partner up there. But um, those sort of statistics about the cost of rescue events as they occur now, how often they happen, how costly they are, and then after the setting up of signage, whether we've been able to reduce this, whether we need to improve our approaches. Um, those are lessons that we can learn from other places, such as Saipan, which has some very similar conditions community-wise um, and, and certainly environmental-wise. Uh, but we can also look for other model programs to be looking at and building upon their successes rather than just creating uh, our own new situation. So um, I appreciate, like I said, all of the comments that you and my fellow senators up here have, have mentioned. It's all about making this bill stronger and ultimately it's all about the bill being stronger so that it's better having that potential to save lives or save others from worrying, being lost, being injured, um, or just not knowing how to prepare or respond to these things. Um, in teaching, and this will be my closing, um, in teaching, 
with university students. I mean, they're adult age already. But we've, we've had different activities where we, I've gone out with them. And for those that uh, didn't see the information about preparing or they weren't there on the day where we discussed it in class, I've had university students in their 20s uh, show up with no water, no hat, no sunscreen, you know, Zoris or something, and then and ready to go. Um, so I think there's a whole lot of need out there. I've seen a lot of it firsthand myself, and I really want to arm them with those tools to uh, to succeed. So, just in closing, with Bill 241. It really is about creating an outreach plan consisting of identifying those hazardous beaches, rivers, and waterfalls, and those hiking hazards out there, and the different types of dangerous conditions that each entails. It's creating safety guidelines for signage at all major hiking trailheads and beaches with strong rip currents, and identifying different types of programs that can create these safety initiatives, whether it be planting more vegetation in specific sites, uh, whether it be um, awareness programs and PSAs, um, whether it's going to the schools and getting all of our youth on board. Um, those are each important things. And just recommending any means found to be uh, possible or to have potential in creating awareness, avoidance, and mitigation of such conditions like we've created uh, for other programs, for being prepared for typhoons, for being prepared for tsunamis, and other events uh, that we've had to learn to teach ourselves as well. So I want to thank all three of you for coming here, for providing testimony, for talking to me over the weeks and months uh, to think about these issues, and my colleagues for being here with me today to discuss what is a very important issue um, that has great potential for all of our island. Merry Christmas to all. Feliz Pesqua. I might... Let's see, put my hat back on. Senator, okay. can, I, can I just make an announcement? Yes. Um, I'd like to wish Senator Kelly Marsh Titano an advanced birthday. Her birthday is actually tomorrow. Happy birthday. <laughs> yes, that, that was a spoiler alert there. Uh, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, and happy holidays. <laughs> happy birthday, Senator. <laughs> to all. Um, I've mentioned to a few that um, as of tomorrow, I will now qualify for uh, senior discounts at the theater. I can go to movies. What is it? Um, I get like $2 off, do you think? I can go you shop eat at free Ross at on Tuesdays. You eat free at Denny's. Sorry? You eat free at Denny's. Oh. And you can go to the front of the line at DMV. Yeah. Yes. No. I, I've been looking forward to going to um, to get that senior uh, representation to go ahead at DMV for a long time. Uh, my father, when he passed away, uh, before he passed away, said that he was, uh, you know, he 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 couldn't ever bring himself to do it. But uh, I said, I've stood in line for 54 years. I, I, I don't think I'll necessarily uh, feel badly, <laughs> but we'll see, we'll see. Time, time will actually tell. But uh, again, Feliz Pascua to all of you. Happy holidays to all, all of you and uh, Happy New Year's in advance as well. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>